I'm Jennifer Waters, the director of the Nikon Imaging Center at Harvard Medical School and a Chan Zuckerberg Initiative imaging scientist. This microcourse covers the confocal principle. The confocal principle is easier to understand if you understand the point spread function. So if you aren't familiar with this concept, I recommend you stop here and watch the point spread function microcourse first. The confocal principle is used in the design of confocal microscopes. And the purpose of a confocal microscope is to reduce the collection of out-of-focus fluorescence. Let's first discuss out-of-focus fluorescence and why it might be a problem. Let's say you have a thick chunk of tissue on a slide and you pop it onto your microscope. Let's first look at the specimen in the axial direction, XZ. The specimen is filled with objects that have been labeled with fluorophore, and you're using a standard epifluorescence microscope with the objective underneath the specimen. Standard fluorescence microscopes use what we refer to as wide field illumination. We call this method of illuminating the specimen wide field because it illuminates the entire field of view. And as the illuminating light passes through the specimen, fluorophores above and below the focal plane of interest are illuminated as well. Each object in the optical image of the specimen generated by the microscope is convolved with the microscope point spread function, which results in a blurred image of the object. This concept is explained in detail in the point spread function microcourse. So the image of each object in the specimen is blurred by the point spread function. The objective is focused on a plane within the specimen, but fluorescence from above and below that focal plane spills into the focal plane, which can be seen both in the XZ and in the XY images of the specimen, where it appears as background fluorescence. Background fluorescence reduces contrast of the image, arguably making it not as pretty, but we aren't artists, we're scientists, and so we're concerned about out-of-focus fluorescence because it can reduce the signal-to-noise ratio of the image. This can occur because out-of-focus fluorescence contributes Poisson noise to the image, which decreases signal-to-noise ratio. Why is signal-to-noise ratio important? High signal-to-noise ratio images are generally easier to segment for image analysis, and high signal-to-noise ratio images will result in more precise measurements of intensity values and less error. Some biological specimens contain lots of out-of-focus fluorescence. Confocal microscopes can be used to increase the signal-to-noise ratio of images of these types of specimens. But does a confocal microscope always improve the image signal to noise ratio? I'm afraid it's not that simple. The major advantage of confocal is reduction of out of focus fluorescence. If your images aren't degraded by out of focus fluorescence, because there's no fluorophore outside the focal plane or your specimen is thin, you won't see that advantage. And the unfortunate reality is that every imaging modality comes with both advantages and disadvantages. So if you aren't getting the advantages, you're only getting the disadvantages. Navigating the advantages and disadvantages of confocal will be covered in another microcourse. For now, let's get back to thinking about the confocal principle. Marvin Minsky developed the confocal principle as a junior fellow at Harvard, just a couple of years after completing his PhD at Princeton. He submitted a patent for the confocal principle and its implementation in a simple confocal microscope in 1957. The confocal principle is still used in modern confocal microscopes. The confocal principle describes how out-of-focus fluorescence is reduced in images using two features, focused illumination and a pinhole at an image plane. Let's work through the details of the confocal principle, beginning with the first feature, focused illumination. As I described earlier, under wide field illumination, the entire field of view is illuminated. Focused illumination means that the illumination light is focused into a small point in the focal plane of the objective lens, which again is the plane the microscope is focused on. I'll point out here that the confocal principle I describe in this microcourse does not alone explain how an image of the entire field of view is collected. 
The confocal principle is used in both single point and multi point scanning confocals, which acquire images of the entire field of view in different ways. How these instruments utilize the confocal principle are topics for another microcourse. Let's look at a diagram of a simplified confocal microscope to see how focused illumination can be achieved, looking first at just the illumination light. In confocal microscopes, lasers are most commonly used as a source of photons to illuminate the sample. The light coming from the laser passes through a collimating lens, which forms a beam of light in which all of the light waves are traveling in the same direction. The light is reflected by a dichroic mirror to the objective lens, which focuses the collimated beam of light into a point source at the focal plane. If you'd like to learn more about how lenses can be used to form collimated beams or to focus light, check out the Microscope Alignment for Optimal Image Quality microcourse. So the light is focused into a point. You might be wondering, what is the size of the illumination point? The objective lens focuses collimated laser light into a point source that's subject to the point spread function. The expected size of the illumination point of light can therefore be calculated using the resolution equation, which I describe in the point spread function microcourse. The resolution equation gives us the expected radius of the point source, which is equal to a constant, 0.61, times the wavelength of light divided by the numerical aperture of the objective lens. We can double this number to get the diameter of the point source. So focused illumination restricts excitation of fluorophores to a small portion of the field of view, but light traveling through the sample, both above and below the focal plane, excites fluorophores that generate out-of-focus fluorescence. This is dealt with by the second feature of the confocal principle, a pinhole at an image plane. Let's go back to our simple diagram of a confocal and look now at the light emitted by the fluorophore in our sample, the emission light path. The image of the sample is focused onto a plane within the microscope that we call the image plane. The pinhole resides at the image plane within the microscope. Fluorescence admitted by objects in our sample that reside in the focal plane of the objective lens is collected by the objective lens, passes through the dichroic mirror, and is focused by the tube lens onto the image plane. The pinhole is positioned such that the focused image can pass through the pinhole and to the detector that collects the emission light photons and is used to generate a digital image of the sample. Any objects outside the focal plane of the objective that are excited by the laser also emit photons that are collected by the objective lens. Images of these objects focus outside of the image plane, such that the image is out of focus when it reaches the pinhole. The pinhole therefore blocks the majority of light emitted from out of focus objects, preventing this light from reaching the detector. I mean, how clever is that? Whether objects in the sample reside above or below the focal plane, the pinhole blocks the majority of the out-of-focus fluorescence. But note that the pinhole cannot block all of it, so it's incorrect to say that confocal microscopes eliminate out-of-focus fluorescence, but they can greatly reduce it. To summarize, Objects outside of the focal plane of the objective are illuminated and emit light, but come into focus outside of the image plane, so the pinhole blocks the majority of the out-of-focus fluorescence from reaching the detector. Meanwhile, images of objects that reside within the focal plane of the objective pass through the pinhole to the detector. Now let's look more closely at the pinhole, specifically how the size of the pinhole affects image quality. When the size of the pinhole matches the size of the image focused on the image plane, the maximum amount of out-of-focus fluorescence is blocked by the pinhole. As the diameter of the pinhole increases, more out-of-focus light is able to pass through. And so the size of the pinhole is an important parameter in confocal microscope performance. If blocking out-of-focus fluorescence is the priority, the pinhole should be adjusted such that it matches the size of the image that reaches the pinhole. Illumination of the sample with a point source leads to an image of a point source of fluorescence. 
When we image a point source with an objective lens, the image of the point source is subject to the point spread function. We can therefore calculate the size of the image of the point source using the equation that gives us the diameter of the point spread function. But since the image of the point source is magnified, we must multiply this number by the magnification. This equation gives us the physical size of the pinhole we would need to maximize reduction of out-of-focus fluorescence. In confocal software, this number is usually referred to as one area unit or one AU. And that's it. That's the basis for how confocal microscopes generate images with reduced out-of-focus fluorescence. Have you ever wondered where the term confocal came from? Now that you understand the confocal principle, it will make perfect sense. The focal plane and the image plane are conjugate focal planes, hence the name confocal. I hope you found this helpful, and now that you understand how important pinhole size is to image quality, I hope that you'll remember to always report the pinhole size in area units or in microns in your method section.